Thanks, Valentin. So, Professor Mariela Herberstein is the head of the Behavioral Ecology Research Group in the Department of Biological Sciences at Macquarie University in Sydney. She completed her undergraduate degree at the University of Sydney and PhD at the University of Vienna in Austria. And she's then joined Macquarie as a lecturer in the Department of Biological Sciences. From 2012 to 15, Mariela was the head of department and from 15 to 16, she was a deputy dean in the Faculty of Science and Engineering. Professor Herberstein held the position of chair of Senate from May 2016 to July 20, and she currently is the interim deputy vice chancellor of the university. Her research focuses on spider behavior and evolution, including sexual selection, mating strategies, signaling and deception, and she is a strong advocate of using spiders as model species. However, her research group conducts research on a wide range of Australasian invertebrate species from mantises to assassin bugs to arlequin bugs and to grasshoppers. And Mariela uh, also shares our interest in diversity and inclusion. And so it is with great pleasure that ABL welcomes her today to give a talk entitled Understanding Animal Behavior from Seagull Species Studies to Large Trait Databases. The floor is yours, Mariela. Great. Thank you very much, Natasha. Thank you very much to the organizing committee for inviting me to give this talk, particularly Natasha and Alexis, who have been looking after me and uh, making sure I'm organized and I'm here uh, in the right place at the right time. So I'd love to talk to you about um, different approaches to understanding um, animal behavior. And I'm, I'm going to bring to you maybe a couple of ideas that I have um, about how we might be successful in that. So, uh, and, and before I start, I'd just like to also um, say that I am uh, a member of the LA Network, and the LA Network at Macquarie University supports um, sexual and gender diversity uh, across uh, the campus. So Natasha has given you a, um, an introduction for me uh, in, in um, uh, my, my pathway, my, my um, career. And, and when, when a speaker is introduced, um, often what happens is um, it's a very linear story. So I did an undergraduate, then um, I did a postgraduate, did my PhD, uh, then I got a postdoc, then I applied for a lectureship, and then I was in a department, and after a few years, I then became the head of department. And then after a little while after that, I became um, uh, the deputy dean a little bit, and then I became chair of Senate, and now I'm this uh, deputy vice chancellor business. And when this is narrated, it always gives the impression that there was a plan, you know, that after, you know, as an undergraduate, I already sort of had this clear path and I was eyeing uh, as an undergraduate to become uh, this deputy vice chancellor. And, and this linearity really only exists as we're looking backwards, because at the time, it gives this impression. It gives the impression that I had from the onset of my university, uh, sort of a clear path. Recording in progress. Got it. Thank you. Um, and so um, the reality is, of course, very, very different. Um, the, the, the fact was that as an undergraduate, I was quite mediocre. Um, I, you know, didn't get very good marks and um, didn't engage well. But towards the end of my degree, I, I kind of realized that I, I enjoyed research and research is something that I want to do. Um, as a postgraduate, uh, was my decision to go back for my PhD to Austria, where I come from, and uh, I didn't do, I didn't pick a very exciting research topic. That wasn't really the focus. The focus going back to Austria was really to have a lot of fun, and I did. Um, so my research, my PhD was was also fairly mediocre. The only thing that I did know is that I had to publish and I had to travel, and so after my PhD, I spent about a year just writing a few papers and fellowship applications 
um, and doing a ridiculous job uh, just on the side. Um, finally, in my postdoc, I kind of woke up to uh, the fact that I actually had to do a little bit of work here. And um, I kind of made up for my low impact PhD. And I really learned a lot of publication skills. I took that away. And when this lectureship was advertised uh, at Macquarie University, um, I applied. And why I got the job, you know, is difficult to say. Um, I think it was a combination of being the right person at the right time. At that time, I had a great publication trajectory. I had just published, I think, 10 papers in a year. I've never done this since. Um, but I kind of looked really good at that time. And I think what I was able to bring across in the interview was that I was really willing to contribute, that I wanted to become a full member of a department and contribute to um, uh, all the activities in a department. When it came to then, and I was very supported by the department in many, many things. So when it came to having to step up uh, uh, or when there was a call for head of department, I was very willing to give back to the department. Um, I'm fairly well organized. I'm very willing to contribute. Um, I'm very willing to lead. And I think I'm, I'm reasonably able to convince people or to um, bring them on board of an idea. And then when um, this, I, I was asked to nominate for chair of Senate, it seemed like utter madness. I always say that uh, the, the Academic Senate is the governance body of the university. It deals with policies and procedures. And I always say that academics go to Senate to die uh, because it is that boring. But uh, again, I felt I wanted to contribute to the university who has who's been very supportive of me. And it, it was turned out actually to be um, more interesting than I thought. I got a very good university perspective and I made, uh, you know, I made a lot, a, a lot of new colleagues, and um, and and I learned a lot. And so then uh, this opportunity came about to become deputy vice chancellor, and uh, I'm in the middle of this, and uh, I, I I can assure you this is definitely madness, um, and I'll tell you in a year about it. So. From my perspective, my career path looked a little bit like this. I just barely saw the next step in front of me and I definitely had no plan and um, opportunities came along and I took those opportunities uh, when they came along. And so that, that's just for me, a little bit of a reflection on, on career paths. And maybe to when when a speaker is being introduced, maybe to think about how they may have actually navigated at the time. I think what helped me along with this career path is is a focus on what I enjoy, uh, which is research and teaching and enabling others. I also understand pretty well what's required: papers, ideas, traveling, building relationships, having broad perspectives. And I'm very, very patient and persistent. And so I think that's kind of helped me along in my career. Okay, so much for my career. So what do I do? Um, I'm a classic behavioral ecologist. I study behavior in an ecological context with a focus on fitness consequences. And I look at, and my research really is encapsulated by two main themes where mating systems and on the one hand and um, deception on the other hand. Um, I work with many different organisms, as Natasha had said, mostly spiders. So you have here on the top left hand, a crab spider feasting on a honeybee. Below that is an ant mimicking spider. Uh, in the middle, the middle picture is a sexually deceptive orchid of which there are an enormous number of, of species in Australia. On the right hand side is uh, possibly the, the species that I work most with, which is the St. Andrew's cross spider. The large individual is the female and the small one is the male. And then occasionally I get to travel to exciting places uh, like Malaysia, where we studied the orchid mantis, which is uh, in the lower middle pictures. Picture. Um, I'll give you 
a couple of examples about this concept of studying individual variation and fitness consequences. So I study these crab spiders and, um, and they come in different colors in Australia. You get uh, sort of yellowish crab spiders and then, uh, and then in the same species, you get individuals that are, that are really white. And, and you can see that from a human perspective, um, particularly the white one and the yellow one, they're, they're really nicely camouflaged against uh, the white and yellow background. And that's from our human perception. When you look at the whole thing um, in a wavelength that um, is not open for, for, for humans, but for uh, animals like honeybees in the UV, the situation looks quite different. Um, the spider is UV bright, um, so it really reflects a lot of UV light, but the flower background is UV dull and doesn't reflect a lot of UV. UV. So the flower to uh, through the UV channel alone is quite dull and there's a bright uh, UV bright uh, spider sitting on top of it. Um, we were interested in, in the fitness consequences of these, um, these color variation um, for foraging success of the crab spiders. And so we, um, we offered, maybe I'll go back if I can, we offered honeybees uh, flowers with spiders, yellow spiders on yellow flowers or yellow spiders on white flowers. And, um, and white spiders on white flowers and white spiders on yellow flowers. And then we just waited for honeybees to land on those flowers. It's, it's an easy experiment. You can do that at home. Um, and then we just count landings. And so what you see here is that there's, there's differences in, in the fitness consequences of this individual variation. So on the, on the y-axis, I have the, the choices uh, of, of the honeybees, whether they're landing on a flower that's occupied by crab spiders or on a vacant flower. And on the x-axis, you have the yellow spiders that are sitting either on a white flower or on a yellow flower, and then the white spiders that are either sitting on a white flower or on a, on a yellow flower. And here you can see that white spiders, regardless of the background, attract honeybees to the flowers relative to vacant flowers. So honeybees will actually prefer to land on a flower with a white spider than on a vacant flower when presented side by side. Whereas the yellow spiders, um, they don't um, attract, don't seem to attract any honeybees. Um, and the likelihood of landings on a flower that is um, occupied by a spider or not is, is relatively the same. It's about 50-50. So this variation in, in color between individuals of the same species has different fitness consequences. And we did some more work uh, to look into um, what it is. Is there trade-offs, um, maybe visibility, camouflage trade-offs, for the different color morphs and, um, and also trade-offs with uh, body condition. And just to illustrate how that might look like, we'll go to the, we'll go to the man himself. Okay, so, uh, so there you heard it. Um, I think if David Attenborough says it, it must be true. So that's some of the work we do with, with deception and variation, but there's also individual variation fitness consequences in, in the mating arena. As I said here, this is the St. Andrew's cross spider, one of the, um, the species that I work a lot with. And here, um, the, the large individual is, is the female. So in the first um, picture on the left-hand side, the male is courting the female on the hub. In the middle picture, you can see the male has just pounced on the female and is, um, has inserted one of his um, sperm transfer organs, the pedipulps, uh, and is starting to transfer sperm. And in the third um, 
picture, you can see the female is starting to um, grab the male with her legs and eventually uh, will try and, and wrap him up and, and then have him for a snack. And terminate copulation in that period. So oh, there he is, there he is. So he's already snackified here uh, by, by the female uh, and, and there's, uh, there's no escape for him. So um, cannibalism, sexual cannibalism is, is quite common in this, in this species and males are very limited in their uh, lifetime mating opportunities. Some males will only mate once in their lifetime. Um, some males uh, can mate twice. Uh, but no more than twice because uh, while they are copulating with the female, even if they can escape the female, or they can escape cannibalism, they uh, break off their uh, copulatory uh, organs. Um, so they have paired pedipalps. And so they made once, they break one of them, then they can mate again and they break the other one. And then, then it's over. They can survive. I can save them from cannibalism. They survive, um, but they can't mate again. So maximal uh, mating opportunities is, is quite. So this looks pretty bad for a male uh, and, uh, you know, I would not recommend. Um, but there are some strategies that males can have to secure their um, their um reproductive investment and protect um, their, their sperm from sperm competition. So here are those pedipalps in the left-hand picture. You can see a male with very large pedipalps. Um, and so there's two of them, they're paired. And in the middle picture, you can see the female genital opening. It also paired has two cop copulatory openings. Uh, and so the one pedipalp will be inserted in one of them. And, um, and then the other one in the other. And during copulation, as I said, the pedipalps break off bits of the pedipalp and then they get stuck in the female copulatory opening. And we find that there's variation, individual variation in um, being, a, and, and these pieces form a plug that prevent other males from inserting into that copulatory opening. But there's individual variation in um, whether these plugs are deployed and whether the plugs remain in the genital opening long enough. And so that this variation, whether they successfully um, plug the female or not, and whether this plug stays in the female for less than seven days or four or more than seven days depends on copulation duration. So on the x-axis here, you can see plug status. Uh, on the y-axis is the mean copulatory duration. And you can see that males who copulated for much shorter were not able to deploy the plug successfully. They still broke their genitalia, but they, they didn't insert uh, the, the plug successfully. And males that copulated for longer, um, more than twice as long, were able to successfully deploy the plug and prevented uh, um, other males from copulation. In, in fact, the plugs are 80% successful in preventing subsequent copulation. So you can see there's individual variation and in this variation in, in plug deployment has fitness consequences in terms of reproductive success. Why uh, not all males successfully plug, uh, we think is a trade-off. Um, shorter copulations may mean they can escape cannibalism um, and have the opportunity of a second um, copulation. Longer copulation increases the chance of cannibalism and the loss of a second copulation, but the protection of uh, the, the, the sperm from sperm competition of their first copulation. So far, so good. Um, so this is, I think, what many behavioral, not all, many behavioral ecologists do. They look at individual variation. They look at fitness consequences. Now, behavioral ecology is a relatively young discipline. Um, it, it, I think, solidified as a society in the 70s, 80s, and it built on ethology. 
But slightly um, deviating from mythology, it had an emphasis on, on fitness consequences of behavioral traits in natural environments. So it takes into consideration the ecology where the uh, behavior is being deployed. And so for the last little while, I've been uh, discussing with colleagues um, what the future for behavioral ecology is. You know, where is it going? And we, we held a workshop a few, few years ago, a couple of years ago, and, and got some funding for that workshop. And, and in that workshop, we kind of identified that, that behavior is, is really critical for the the grand challenges, the 21st century challenges for biology. And that challenge is to apply fundamental knowledge to apply problems. And our biggest problem that, that we have right now is climate, uh, global climate change. And so behavior and physiological responses to climate change are critical because um, they can um, mediate short to medium term um, mitigations uh, to climate change. Um, and so we think that behavioral ecology has a really strong potential to contribute to these challenges if, they are, if it's applied at the right spatial scale. And this has been, the spatial scale, this has been applied very successfully in macroecology and macrophysiology, where um, traits, trait variation is captured between populations and species across entire landscapes. But we didn't invent anything new here. This is, was already um, anticipated by Tim Bergen, uh, who, who um, who said that behavior will change with ecological settings across landscapes in different in environmental settings. And of course, we have some very classic behavioral ecology studies, for example, uh, that, that have applied this concept of comparing traits across populations and species across landscapes. And so we have, um, for example, John Endler's work on, on guppy uh, coloration um, relative to water turbidity um, and, and, and predation across many different populations and, and those little pools where the guppies occur. Uh, similarly, um, uh, work by Hunter and Krebs about how habitat structure influences birdsong, uh, again, uh, across uh, landscapes, across different environments. And some very exciting new studies very, um, uh, very broad scale studies, you know, studies on bird behavior relative to large environmental variables at a global scale. So for example, comparing divorce rates amongst birds across the global scale, cooperative breeding across the global scale and cooperation in bioparental care. So very big scaled uh, view of behavior. But this is not widely, applied. We had a look at papers that are sort of random ecology um, journals. Oh, sorry. No, the journals weren't random. We picked five ecology journals and five behavior journals, and we randomly selected papers uh, out of these journals. And we looked at whether the research investigated variation between individuals within individuals, so within individual in the orange, between individuals in green, between species in purple, and between populations in gray. And you can see that in, uh, in behavioral journals, um, the green column dominates. So variation is being investigated at the level of between individuals of the same species and population. In ecology, what you find is a bigger proportion of studies that look at variation between populations and between species. And when we then looked at the top cited papers, both in ecology and in behavior, you will find that, and we looked at citation as a measure of 
impact uh, as a measure of maybe broad appeal or broad recognition, we find that certainly the top cited papers um, in ecology were almost in some years or in some decades predominantly between populations. Um, and uh, whereas in behavior, the, the pattern stays that the, the focus is really between individuals uh, and not between species or populations. And then there's, a, you can see orange is creeping up in, in, in the last few years of a, a focus on uh, variation within individuals, personalities, um, that sort of thing. So what, what we are suggesting uh, in, in a paper that we're preparing is, is a way forward. And, and we, we really haven't invented anything new because macrophysiology has already proposed this. And what, we're, what we are proposing for behavioral ecology is sort of a similar approach where we look at um, species at different sites, uh, some sort of trait measurement here, um, through which we can arrive at species means across different populations. We can look at assemblage means of different species at different sites um, and, and get a real uh, matrix of um, trait values across populations, sites, and species. We think this approach, which I just want to say again, that of course there are some behavioral ecologists who are doing this already. We're not inventing anything new. We're just advocating a broader pick up, take up of that practice. I think um, this approach has great potential for behavioral ecology because um, there has already been great methodological development uh, for trait analyses, um, by uh, fields like macroecology or macrophysiology. So we could just pick that up. Behavioral ecology is rich in theory. It, it has very uh, clear predictions about behavioral variation. So I think it lends itself very much to this approach. Um, I, I think it's, it's quite different to perhaps um, some of the macroecology, which um, just explains or, or you know, um, not just, but tends to explain patterns, large scale patterns, but not so much predicting them. Um, so, um, you know, some of the macroecologies is post hoc explanations of very large scale patterns. Um, I think it can retain the traditional focus on selective benefits, which is definitely a strength of behavioral ecology. And it can still maintain the focus on individual variation as the point of action for natural selection. <clears throat> so that's what we're advocating for, is just a, 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 um, an adoption of, of a, a, a a different scale of investigation. Again, we're not reinventing this. This has already been published by the macrophysiologists um, that um, um, have proposed this environment by trade matrix, whatever trades you're interested in. Um, and we're, we're just advocating to quantify behavioral variation across multiple species, across multiple sites. And perhaps this is, this is what, what we are hoping for at, at, at some stage where we have a global map of a behavioral trait. This is a paper by Katzke 2011 uh, on specific leaf size area. Obviously this is not an animal trait, this is a, it is a plant trait. And, um, and but, you know, um, looking at that scale of a trait um, I think is extremely powerful and can, can explain, um, you know, a, a lot of the questions that we may have, uh, particularly about environmental change. Um, of course, uh, I have to admit, um, leaf size
So talking about trade space, so I just said that the plant ecologists are, are particularly um, Was it this one? This one? Okay. Good. But I'm back now. Okay. All right. So, um, so in this slide, I was just uh, advocating, um, um, well, just saying that we're not reinventing this. We're just applying concepts that have already been applied in macrophysiology and to establish both behavioral ecology and environment by by trait matrix and, and to quantify by behavioral variation across multiple species and sites to perhaps arrive at something like this, which is a, a global map mapping a trait, um, a trait across over 1800 sites. Uh, of course, the trait is not a behavioral trait, it's a plant trait, it's leaf size area. And um, and, uh, you know, I, I have to admit, uh, variation in leaf size it does not interest me whatsoever, uh, but the ecologists are very insistent on publishing an enormous amount of papers on variation in leaf size. Uh, and the power to them is that they have an enormous trait database on plant leaf size, and they can unfold this trait variation um, for many species across many, many sites. And that is very powerful, um, a powerful science. Our vision, of course, is to have an animal trait space onto which we can now map behavior because um, maybe we can fight back against those uh, leaf size uh, papers a little bit with maybe something, something different. Um, here we are again, plants. So the plant people are doing this uh, incessantly. Uh, here is um, a map of, of plant traits. Uh, these are um, four, five, six, or eight uh, plant, uh, plant traits, including seed, seed size, leaf size, um, something about photosynthesis, woodiness, and so on. And, and they've mapped a few thousand species into that trait space. Um, and these are just sort of heat maps of where there's lots of species, what trait spaces these species occupy. Uh, the, the red clouds on the left-hand side are the gymnosperms and the red, red cloud on the, on the, on the right-hand side are the angiosperms or the other way around. It's the other way around, I think. And this sort of map, this sort of map of trade space can, can give you a lot of information. It, it, it kind of tells you what, what sort of trade combinations are successful because lots of species are using those trade combinations. It can also tell you something about model species. Um, if you see the number four here on the left-hand side of the figure, that is Arabidopsis, the Drosophila of the plant world. And you can see that Arabidopsis as the model species is really quite extraordinary, extraordinarily different from most other plants. And so that may give you some, some idea about what sort of species to use as a model species to um, generalize onto other species. Anyway, uh, as I said, plants, we are really interested in behavior. So our aim is to establish an animal traits database that is reliable, that's open, it's high quality, um, with ultimate transparency and flexibility that minimizes uh, errors uh, due to manual or ad hoc data conversion. And we want to use this, this animal trait database to map behavioral and other traits of interest onto the database. And so after many, many discussions with our brains trust, we have arrived at the basic animal traits that we're interested in uh, is body size, brain size, and metabolic rate. And we started with these three traits. Um, and we were extremely careful in 
the provenance of the data that we extracted to put into the trade database, we only used um, published data and, and we entered the data in their original form without transformation. But in the trade database, we uh, provide scripts and um, the ability to transform the different metrics in which the data were originally collected into standard metrics but that's up to the user to do the transformation. So that creates incredible transparency of, of the quality of the data. So where are we at? Um, we have um, collected metabolic rates from over 600 species, uh, body mass from over 800 species and brain mass from over 1400 species. And, um, and we're currently um, in the, with, this is currently being reviewed and hopefully um, accepted and published soon. And then the database is open to everyone who wants to use it. Um, just, a, just a reminder, we, uh, we decided not to go for any aquatic animals uh, because we felt that that would, um, would um, make it really difficult uh, in terms of uh, the body mass, brain mass um, algorithm um, um, relationship and, and metabolic rate would be quite different. So we stuck to terrestrial animals at this stage. So here's just a snapshot of what we have and what it might look like. So here on the left-hand side, you can see body mass on the x-axis and metabolic rate on the y-axis. And the figure on the right-hand side is brain size on the right uh, on the uh, y-axis. And we've just pulled out a few examples of some species um, where they may uh, end up in these um, along these allometric lines uh, between body mass, metabolic rate, and brain and brain size. Um, what we want to use is this trait database, as I said, we want to map um, behavior. We want to use this database to understand behavior. And so we thought as a proof of principle of how such a trait database can help us understand behavior, we would go out and test the social brains hypothesis. And the social brains hypothesis says that brain size and social behavior are related. So more social animals also have larger brains than less social animals. So in addition to our trait database, we also went out and scored aspects of social behavior. Again, very, very long discussions. And we decided we are scoring for the species for which we have brain size, whether they're solitary, whether they're aggregating, uh, whether they form social monogamous pairs, whether they show parental care, cooperation, family groups, and whether they use social. And the prediction would be if we had a score of so size and the less social animals, there they would be below that line. And I'm just double checking that I I'm still going, I'm not freezing. I think. Okay. 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 Everything's all right. I, I continue. So after some preliminary analyses, um, um, we we realized we need to take taxonomic, uh, taxon specific allometry uh, into account. We we realized that summing up behavior is not too informative and that statistics by color is probably not going to be acceptable. Um, so we then decided, well, I, well, let's start with the first behavior that we scored, which is solitary versus aggregating behavior, and for which we also have the greatest number of data, po uh, data points. And what we find is that different animal groups have, you know, um, have different results, really. Um, in birds, we don't, so on the y-axis is uh, the log size corrected brain mass, so brain relative to mass. And in yellow are uh, species that don't aggregate and in red, the species that aggregate. And in birds, there's really no difference in brain size, whether they aggregate or not. 
But in mammals, um, there is a difference. So mammals that aggregate have relatively larger brains than mammals that don't aggregate. And, uh, and, and certainly that is also very true in primates. So primates that aggregate uh, uh, have larger brains than primates that don't aggregate. So our next step with uh, this work is to publish the database. We need to complete scoring behaviors. There are still some groups we haven't scored through and then um, test the social brains hypothesis in sort of analyses that are a little bit similar to this um, with the other behavior um, for different groups uh, um, and to see how, how, how broad, broadly applicable this social brains hypothesis is. Okay, so I'm coming to the end. Um, so my ideal behavioral ecology pipeline would be I have a phenomenon like uh, this war the, the warning signals in this in this day flying moths. Um, we capture individual variation in this trait. Um, we test ultimate factors like how do predators respond to variation in warning signals. We test Approximate factors, how does temperature during the development of these moths affect um, the expression of these warning signals? Um, we compare populations and species, and that may tell us that um, warning signal expression is, is varies between populations and even species. And we can, oops. And then we can, of course, uh, interpret that, whether that's something about local environment, maybe the local temperatures, or something about local, um, local uh, predator communities that, put, uh, that uh, place selection on the warning signals themselves. Um, so relate to local environment. And then we can map these species traits in, in, in trait space. So when we're talking about warning signals, we can ask questions whether species that produce warning signals, whether they have, um, whether they occupy a particular trait space, whether they're of a particular size, whether they have a particular trait space in, in, in metabolic rates, for example. You can look at, at warning signals with toxins versus warning signals without toxins. So uh, mimics, Batesian mimics, and also ask whether they occupy different trait spaces in terms of um, uh, metabolic rates, for example. Is it, is it, is it, does it cost more metabolic rates to maintain um, toxins compared to Batesian mimics, for example? So that's sort of the, the ultimate outcome of, of putting together um, landscape level uh, investigation as well as as trade space trade space level investigation, and with that, I'd like to thank you again uh, and and acknowledge the the traditional owners of the lands of Macquarie University, the Wallamatical clan of the Darug Nation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mariela. Uh, it was a very interesting perspective. We already have several questions in the YouTube chat. So the first one is from Tamzin Sahulensis. I'm sorry for the pronunciation. How do comparative psychology and behavioral ecology differ? How does psychology? Comparative psychology and behavioral ecology. Psychology and behavioral ecology. Um, I, I do think, um, number one, I would think is, is a, a lack of a psychology, I don't think, looks at fitness consequences or at, um, at uh, the ecological relevance of or the, the ecology of where the behavior is being expressed. However, I do think that both have an interest in behavior, um, perhaps psychology more in, into the, the proximate mechanisms of, of behavior and less so in, in, in the ultimate mechanisms. But I'm not a psychologist, so I feel inadequate to really answer that question. All right. Um, the second question is from Lisa Chance. Um, she said, with between individuals, do you mean individual animals or groups of individuals or both? 
Well, individual animals for most cases. I think with social insect, I think there, there's an argument to be made that uh, the value of comparing individuals of the same hive because they're very, very, very closely related and maybe it, it has greater value to compare different hives uh, and, and capture that, that variation, but mostly variation between individual animals. All right, thank you. Next one is from Bhavya Pratsam Singh. If a male can't plug female a female, what would be the distribution of offspring when the same female mates with another male? I assume that the one who mated first will still have more fitness than the next male. Um, not necessarily. I think the, the average, no, not necessarily. I think what determines paternity in, in these particular species is the relative copulation duration. So the male that copulates relatively longer, whether that's the first or the second male, um, gains paternity. Um, if the two males inseminate the two different genital openings, then the sperm don't mix of the two males. They are stored in separate sperm storage organs. Um, so you don't get sperm mixing but um, it's really relative copulation duration that determines paternity. Yeah, that's the particularity with other insects, no? That there are, there are two like orifices in this species compared to honeybees, for instance. Yeah, so insects only have a single copulatory opening and, and could have multiple sperm storage organs, but I think the chances of sperm packages of multiple males mixing are much greater. Sorry, Natasha, I just, yeah. Sorry, I clicked, but it was not clicked enough. We have another question from Lisa Chance. Do you know if there are such efforts as your traits database for livestock or pets? Ooh. There would be a surprise if there weren't, but I haven't come across that. But... And because we didn't take our data from existing um, collections, meta-analyses or trade database, because we wanted to go back to the original paper, we, I, I'm actually not sure. But I would be surprised if there weren't like cattle, sheep trades that were collected somewhere. Okay. Um, Francesca Furick is thanking you for your really interesting presentation and specifically for the beginning of your presentation for master degree students, because she said it was very reassuring. <laughs> and then we have a question from Abby George, who is a member of the committee um, organizing ABL. He said, great talk. I'm wondering what the trade-offs might be in moving towards these trade-based databases. For example, would we miss out on some rare, interesting behaviors that differ between individuals. Yeah, I, I, guess I just think so. I think there's a there's a chance, and I think many, perhaps some plant ecologists have fallen into there, where in the end all you do is crunch numbers in very large databases, and you. Um, I think uh, it, no one loves plant ecologists more than I, and and you know I. Um, but um, I think they've, they've kind of lost a, a little bit of the, um, the importance of individual variation because you, you are um, essentially you have a, a data point for species. And I do think maintaining a focus on individual variation and that requires, you know, going out there and not just dealing with an average, I think is very important. But yes, that's a trade off. And that's, I, I, I'm a natural historian. It's really important to just sit there and watch and observe and discover. Absolutely. All right, thank you. Um, then we have Paul Chen, who says, thank you for the great talk. 
I would like to ask, was there a higher frequency of UV bright white crab spider compared to UV dull yellow crab spider? Any idea what is keeping the yellow morph? Yeah, um, we didn't do a very systematic um, sampling where I could say that uh, we have, you know, um, unbiased data. Um, um, certainly the yellow morphs, we only found on yellow flowers. So the yellow morphs are kind of restricted to yellow flowers and there they form very little contrast. They have very little UV and the white spiders we find on yellow and white um, flowers because they're just contrasting on in, on every um, on in, on any background. So I think the trade-off is about camouflage. So not having lots of UV reflected means being yellow. Um, I think the trade-off is is perhaps uh, camouflage against predators, and uh, being white means attracting prey, but possibly also predators. And that's the trade-off, I think. All right, thank you. We have another question from Alberto Mayer. Wonderful presentation. Out of curiosity, I missed humans' metabolic rate on body mass in your graphic. Where are we along the line? So the the the, the um the, we have human brain size and body size on the on the graph. I'm not sure about the metabolic rate. Let me have a look. I can just flip that out up again and share that. I don't know whether we have, I'd have to go back in to have a look at whether we have the, so the humans are up here. So on the right hand graph, right at the top, there's a bunch of humans in their brains and their body mass. But I can't see them in the metabolic rate. I'd be surprised if we don't have humans in under the metabolic rate. All right. I don't think there are more questions coming from the YouTube chat right now. Um, but if people have more questions and they were too shy to ask them directly in the YouTube chat, they can always ask them on the Discord server. So Mayela already has access to it and we put the link in the YouTube chat so you can just directly connect to the discords. Um, I have a question. It's maybe a dumb, but maybe I missed the information, but uh, do we know the exact mechanism why the UV bright spiders are more visited by honeybees? Is it just like the UV pattern that are attracted them? Yeah, I think it's just the, the UV. It's just super attractive to um, the honeybees. We we ran our experiment with uh, occluding odor, so with a with a transparent um, plastic foil over them, so it wasn't the, the odor of the flower or the spider. And it's just, um, I think the honeybees just love UV. All insects love UV. And, and that makes a difference, I think, for them. Interestingly, um, Australian bees, native Australian bees, they're also attracted to the flower with the spider and they fly around the flower, but they don't land. Mm -hmm. So there seems to have been some sort of co-evolutionary step that the European honeybee doesn't have. They just land immediately. But the Australian native bees, they are more cautious. They're still attracted. They come closer, but they don't land. That's very interesting, though, because I would have thought that it would it could be a sensory bias in the European honeybee, but then it wouldn't have been conserved in the at the evolutionary scale. Like it would have appeared in the European, but not in the, in the Australian honeybee. I, I think the sensory bias works for the Australian honeybee as well. So that's why they're coming closer and they're inspecting the flower. It's just as maybe it's because they take more time and maybe they can see the shape of the spider and then they don't they don't land whereas the european honeybees go and just land immediately okay so it's not completely hardwired i mean the attraction to uv the uv receptor in honeybees 
is, is so much more sensitive than the other two receptors. I, I think being attracted to UV is, is not is, is hardwired because of that sensitivity of the UV receptor. Uh, I think the behavioral step that the Australian honeybees have protects them from landing okay. when there's danger. We have more questions coming in the YouTube chat. So Said Safia Sabet, who is a member of the committee of ABL as well, says, interesting talk, thank you. Comparing to terrestrial animals, what would be your prediction for aquatic animals such as fish in terms of body mass versus brain size and all body mass versus metabolic rate? Oh God, I, th I think, um, oh, I, I think because of the lack of, of um, constraints on body mass through gravity, I think what we could see is maybe a um, sort of a different allometric relationship between body size and, and brain size. Maybe that the body sizes can get a little bit larger compared to the brain sizes because there's not, there's not the sort of gravity constraint on it. Um, that's, that's what I think, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe we should have we should have collected data on the aquatic stuff as well, so that we know what, what the difference is. For metabolic rate, I think it's yeah. I think I, because of water having so much more stable um, temperatures, I, I think one could really expect a sort of a difference in metabolic rate there. Okay, and Alberto Mayer was just uh, responding to what you just said. Thanks mm -hmm. uh, regarding the metabolic rate, but for, I think it was for humans. He said still mammals have quite high rates. So I don't mammals know. have high rates, high metabolic, metabolic rates. Metabolic rate, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, they do, yeah. I think, yeah, correct. Okay. Um, we still have one minute left, so if people have more questions, they are welcome to ask them on the YouTube chat. Meanwhile, I have another one, and it will be my last one, I think, regarding the um, social brain hypothesis. There are many papers that are like arguing that it's not valid and that there would be like ecological parameters that would explain the brain size better than the sociality yeah. of species. Is it something I, that you take into consideration? I agree. I, 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 I am not the I'm not of, of a particular um, defense of the social brain hypothesis. It's just uh, I think um, we just I, because it's debated and because it's usually answered in very specific groups. There's lots of data testing social brain hypothesis in primates, for example. Um, we thought maybe the best way through this um, and moving that question forward is by looking at it across many different animals, including um, invertebrates and, 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 you know, testing it across birds and reptiles and amphibians and invertebrates and mammals and just seeing how applicable this idea is. And then I think then we can go, okay, if it's not a global explana explanation, let's look at, at more local explanations like local ecological conditions. All right. Thank you very much, Mariela. We are Thank up. you very much. <laughs> so uh, we have now 10 minutes of break and then we are coming back. 